Next uh, and last speaker is Professor Abraham Kribus from Tel Aviv University. Uh, professor Kribus uh, uh, is a full professor at the Faculty of Engineering at Tel Aviv University. Uh, main the main topics of his research are solar photothermionic conversion, thermoelectrochemical storage, thermodynamic cycles for uh, power production. He is head of the Solar Energy Lab that I have the honor to visit uh, two years ago for a European project Prometheus. And uh, he is a consultant for many solar energy companies in Israel and abroad, a co-founder of a solar energy startup and he is editor of more than 250 publications as well as uh, 8 patents. Today he will present a um, speech on solar electricity generation and storage with a thermoelectrochemical cycle. So. staying so late in the day after so many exciting lectures. So everybody has been talking about uh, ultra high temperature storage, but I'm not going to talk about it. So our real reference to good storage is actually the existing systems. Today we have uh, systems for storage of energy that are already implemented on very large scale, like batteries, like uh, pumped hydro storage, like molten salt for thermal energy storage. And these are actually working, and in many cases they are competitive, cost-effective, and there is no problem with them, except each one of them has a problem. Like batteries have a... Sorry? I don't know. I thought you arranged it. <laughs> okay. Is it working now? Apparently... Hmm? So, so maybe, so you maybe you can okay. be close to the, it, it finished oh. working. Okay, so many engineers here and nothing is working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I will try to stay close to this one. Uh, so each one of the existing methods of energy storage has its own problem. The ultra high temperature storage may work at some point, but it's not there yet, right? Sorry, guys. Um, so, if we think about the, the um, storage method that uh, most people think about when they consider solar energy is to use photovoltaic power plants in order to generate electricity and then send the electricity to uh, a set of batteries. But if we think about this as a complete conversion system, eventually we have something like 20% efficiency conversion from sunlight to electricity and then the round-trip efficiency of the batteries is somewhere between 70-75%. So total we have a conversion efficiency of about 14%. And I think this is terrible, right? We started with 100% of solar energy and we came up with nothing, almost. Um, if we consider solar thermal energy, then the people of the molten salt will say our storage is extremely efficient, maybe 98% over 24 hours. That's true, but the mechanical conversion of thermal energy later is a very low efficiency. So the end result is very similar to this, maybe a little bit higher, maybe 16%, not 14%, but it's about the same. So what we need is to look at the complete system, not only at the storage component, and ask what is the overall conversion efficiency from our original resource, which is solar energy, to electricity that we get out of the system and to the consumer. So what if we could do something like that? Take a battery, an electrochemical system, and not charge it with electricity, but charge it with thermal energy. 
And why not charge it with electricity? That's because solar electricity is the component or the step, the conversion step, that causes the most energy losses. If we could charge it with heat, we skip this uh, step of converting sunlight to electricity, and maybe the overall result would give us a better system. Is it possible? Um, okay, so if we can do it, we can have a unified system of generation and storage altogether. And uh, actually, we would also be doing something that, that is very nice, and that is converting heat to electricity. That is, heat is the input to this process, and electricity comes out. Uh, without turbines and, and, and all of these rotating machineries that have been in existence for 200 years, and they give us a lot of trouble. They are mature technology, they are maybe efficient, but they are troublesome. Uh, okay, so how can this process be done, in principle at least, without saying exactly which materials and, and what, what exactly we are doing? So let's think about the electrochemical system as two materials, let's say A and B, that can be separate, but they can also be combined into some kind of compound AB. So when we want to make electricity, we bring these two materials in contact in an electrochemical cell, and one of these materials migrates across the membrane and creates the compound, and the compound goes back here, and electricity is generated, and this AB is at a lower energy state, and, and everything is fine. This is actually what happens in every electrochemical battery that we have today. Now the charging process. Instead of pushing electricity into the battery to reverse the process, we take this compound AB outside, we send it to a thermochemical reactor that is uh, powered by solar energy. AB is decomposed thermally to A and B. We need also to separate them, and this is not so simple, but let's assume that we can do it. And then we can store A and B separately, and we come back to the starting point of the cycle. And if we choose these materials correctly, then the temperatures of the storage here can be either room temperature or maybe slightly higher, but uh, not ultra-high storage, but actually very convenient storage close to room temperature. And these materials, because they are separated, they will not react, they will not degrade, and they just sit there and wait until the moment that we want to make electricity, and then we can send them to the electrochemical cell. So this is the general idea of this process. If we can do it, then we don't have to have uh, the uh, conversion directly from sunlight to electricity. We don't need to have conversion from heat to electricity using all of these heat engines and we have something that is different. Uh, this is also in the category of a flow battery, in the sense that we store the materials not inside the electrochemical cell, but outside the cell. And this gives us an advantage that if we want to have more energy, let's say to store energy for a longer time operation, we don't need more electrochemical cells, we just need larger tanks. So this decouples power from energy, which is a very nice degree of freedom that we can get in a flow battery. So actually this is not a new idea. It was suggested a long time ago, and uh, people worked on it for a while. But back then in the 50s and early 60s, they tried materials like liquid metals in order to do this kind of process. And it worked, but the performance was terrible. Very low efficiency, very low voltages from these liquid metal cells. So after a few years of work, this idea was uh, abandoned. People didn't work on it anymore. And they called it thermally regenerative batteries because the regeneration or the charging is done thermally. Okay, so can we reconsider uh, this kind of idea or this kind of approach, but using the modern available materials and what is needed in order to do that. So we considered several sets of materials that are actually used in batteries today. So we didn't invent some new chemistry. We just took existing chemistry to consider if it's possible to do this kind of thermal charging. So one system is a sodium sulfur battery. It's a commercially available battery. It's implemented on large scale. Um, this is a picture of one system that was built to store energy from a wind farm. Uh, and it uh, uses sodium and sulfur. When they uh, combine, they produce sodium polysulfide, where this X can have several values between two and four or five. And uh, it is possible to take this sodium polysulfide to add heat and decompose it back to sodium and sulfur. 
and then we can need to separate them and store them separately. And each one of these materials, it's not a completely friendly material. Sodium, we know it has a little problems, but there is existing technology on how to handle these materials. Also, they can be stored at room temperature. So we can store for a long time without any additional losses. Another system that we considered is zinc air. It is used usually in this type of uh, small batteries. Um, and this is zinc in a, a composition with uh, oxygen from the air. It creates zinc oxide. Usually these batteries are primary batteries. They are not rechargeable. But if we can take the zinc oxide and decompose it with heat, we get zinc and oxygen. The oxygen goes back to the air, and the pure metal zinc can go back to the beginning of the uh, next cycle. And another variation that we considered is zinc, air, and carbon. So zinc oxide, not by itself, but with addition of carbon and with addition of heat, will decompose to zinc and CO. And why do we do that? In order to reduce the temperature of this decomposition reaction, and I will show that uh, in a minute. So the first analysis that we did is to assume that everything is ideal. So this is sort of equivalent to a Carnot efficiency or uh, any, any of these ideal analysis to see what is the upper limit for conversion efficiency for a process like this. And these are the results for sodium sulfur the conversion efficiency or the solar efficiency, when we also consider the fact that this reactor is exposed to concentrated solar energy, so the aperture of this uh, reactor will radiate uh, red, uh, energy into the environment, and this is also an additional loss that cannot be avoided. So if we concentrate radiation by 1,000 times, we can get efficiency overall of about 40-something uh, percent. If we concentrate 3,000 times, which is not simple, but it can be done, we can get efficiency of 60% on the overall conversion between entering solar radiation and exiting electricity. Um, and here comes the ultra-high temperature. This requires a temperature of more than 1,600 degrees, so this is not uh, easy to do. The same analysis for zinc air system, again, if we have the concentration that is high enough, we can reach more than 60% overall conversion. Again, I remind you, this is an ideal system, and not, not yet with realistic losses. But this, again, requires very high temperature. And this is the other variation. If we add carbon to this mixture of zinc oxide, uh, then carbon is a reducing agent that makes the reaction, the decomposition of the zinc oxide a lot easier. And we can get similar levels of uh, efficiency, something like 60%, at a temperature of 1,200K. That is below 1,000C. And this is a much more manageable uh, temperature. And also, because the temperature of the reactor is much lower, we can be satisfied also with a lower concentration of the sunlight entering the reactor, which is also very good in terms of the technology that we need in order to reach the concentration of sunlight. Okay, so, so actually from all of these, this is maybe the most practical option. Although we are discussing ultra-high temperature, but if we can avoid ultra-high temperature, it's even better. Okay, so the next step is to make an analysis of a more detailed engineering style cycle with uh, assigning some losses or efficiencies to each one of the components. Uh, this is not a real engineering design. We cannot go ahead and build the plant, but at least it represents the major components that are needed for the cycle. So we can see here the storage of zinc oxide, which is the low energy level material. We mix it with carbon, send it to the reactor, decompose. Here we have CO and zinc <coughs> gas. Here we have a quencher to reduce the temperature until the zinc vapor is condensed. And once we have liquid zinc, we can separate more easily from the CO. This has to be very fast, because if we do it slowly, then the contact between the zinc vapor and the CO will cause the reverse reaction to occur, and again we get zinc oxide. This is not good, so this is an interesting challenge, how to make this cooling fast enough. Uh, after we have that, we can separate. We have the liquid zinc, and then we can solidify and store the zinc as a powder at room temperature indefinitely until it is needed. Uh, we also have an interesting byproduct, which is CO coming out of the system. In principle, we can, for example, combust the CO, uh, get CO2, and um, 
uh, extract the thermal energy that is embodied by the CO and make steam or make electricity something uh, that, that, that can be useful. So actually we have here two outputs. One output is from the pure zinc that goes into the electrical cell and makes electricity. The other one is from the CO that we can make steam, for example, and send it to a power plant, conventional power plant, to make electricity. Uh, we also have to pay attention that this is a hybrid cycle in the sense that we have input of solar energy here, but we also have input of carbon here, and carbon, ha carbon has some embodied chemical energy within it. Uh, of course, we would like the carbon to be from some renewable resource, not from coal, for example, but this is another question, where to take the, the carbon. So because this is a hybrid cycle, whenever we say this is the efficiency, we have to separate between the overall efficiency and take the output, separate it into two parts. One is assigned to the carbon input, the other one assigned to the solar input, and we need to say what is the conversion efficiency for the solar energy. Uh, okay. So here's the result of the more practical or less idealized uh, cycle. Uh, we took some values that seem reasonable in terms of efficiencies for all components. And this is the breakdown of the energy, and this is the net electricity output, which is 35%. So the overall efficiency concerning both the, coal or the carbon input and the solar input is 35%. And if we separate only the part of the output electricity that is due to the solar energy, we get an efficiency, a solar efficiency of 32%. And if we compare to the existing options of producing electricity and storing it from uh, uh, solar energy, then of course these are very low, below 20%. Uh, if we had CPV systems, some of them were very efficient. They are not implemented by industry today because they are too expensive. But if they were in existence, then the overall efficiency would be about 25%, and this is slightly over 30%. But these materials were just the first choice. If we think about electrochemistry, the best material that, that is known is lithium. And uh, I'm not talking about the lithium ion batteries, which are a commercial product, I'm talking about lithium air. So if we consider an electrochemical system similar to the zinc air that I mentioned before, but using pure lithium and the ability to take oxygen from the atmosphere and do the reaction and produce a, a, a lithium oxide, this actually has an energy density that is similar to conventional fuels, an order of magnitude higher than all the other batteries that are in existence today. Uh, so why is it not used today? And the answer is there are some fundamental problems that I will show uh, in a moment. So basically what we have here is a, an electrode of pure lithium, a membrane, a membrane that allows the transport of lithium ions uh, back and forth. And here we get lithium oxide with oxygen that comes from the outside. And when we charge, we have to decompose these lithium oxides and the lithium migrates back to this uh, electrode. The problem is that when the lithium goes back to the original electrode, it doesn't plate the electrode in a very smooth and nice uh, layer as it was before. It creates all of these strange structures that are called dendrites, and this is something that's very difficult to avoid. And because of these structures, actually, uh, they penetrate into the membrane, create shortcuts, and they also can create situations like this, that the dendrite grows and contracts, and then pieces of lithium are suspended in the middle somewhere, and there is no electrical contact to these pieces, so this lithium is lost. So actually, a rechargeable lithium air battery does not exist, or at least those that have been tried are not really working. Another problem is that in order to charge the battery electrically, we need an overvoltage, and we see here that the overvoltage is actually huge. So this is already a penalty in efficiency of about 40% or something like that. So this is not really practical. But imagine that instead of trying to bring the lithium back to the original electrode, we take the lithium oxide outside, we decompose it thermally, and then we bring back the lithium in a pure form to form a new, uh, a, a new electrode. And in this case, we don't have this kind of growth because we have liquid lithium somewhere that we can just coat on a surface and, and produce the electrode. And uh, if we keep the entire battery 
at this temperature above 180 degrees, then the lithium is liquid anyway. We don't need a solid electrode. And of course, if we charge thermally, then overvoltage is not a question. So we can eliminate these fundamental problems if we are able to do it, uh, to charge the battery thermally. Okay, so if we take the lithium oxides, we have two stages in the heating. First of all, at around room temperature, most of the oxide is in this form, lithium peroxide. When we heat to about 400 degrees, oxygen is released and the peroxide becomes lithium oxide. And then we need to continue heating until it is decomposed. If again, we add carbon to the mix, then around this temperature, 1100 C, the lithium oxide and carbon react, the lithium is released and the carbon takes the oxygen and becomes carbon monoxide, similar to the same process that I showed before with zinc oxide. Now this needs to be done at a slight under pressure or slight vacuum. And if we try to do it without vacuum, the needed temperature is again, ultra high temperature of 1600 degrees. If we try to do it without carbon, again, we need these very high temperatures. So it seems that a more practical or reasonable thing is to have this combination of adding carbon and uh, doing this uh, slight vacuum. And here's the cycle that we should have. Uh, we take the lithium peroxide, we heat to 400 degrees to get lithium oxide, mix with carbon, go to the solar reactor. Here we have lithium vapor and CO. We need to quench to about 600 degrees in order to liquefy the lithium. We can separate, the lithium cools down and goes to storage, let's say at a temperature of 200 degrees in order to keep the lithium liquid. This makes it also easy to take later the, liqu the liquid lithium and uh, put it into the electrochemical cell. And again, we get an output of CO that can be used to generate heat and generate additional electricity. So again, this is a hybrid cycle because we have also input of carbon here, not only the input of solar energy. Okay, so a few words about technology that we need in order to do this kind of cycle. First of all, uh, we need to take lithium oxide and carbon. Both of them are solids and we need to put them in the solar reactor. Um, this is not so easy because moving solids is not easy. It's certainly not at high temperature. So we need to have some kind of technology to uh, take this mixture of powders, put them into the solar reactor. After the reaction, everything is vapor or gas, so this is not a problem. So removing the products is not a problem, but we need to develop some kind of particle receiver. Uh, in order to do this reaction. And actually there are several kinds of particle receivers that have been developed not for this application, but for other applications. So the fundamental knowledge on how to do this is already in existence. This is an example of a similar process that was done not with lithium oxide, but with zinc oxide. Uh, but this is a batch reactor. So everything was put in here before illumination and the reaction continued until all the material was consumed. So this is a kind of proof that the chemical process is actually occurring, but it is not a proof that we know how to build a continuous reactor. The other question is this uh, quenching that I mentioned. We have to cool down the products, the gas mixture, very fast in order to prevent the uh, back reaction. Uh, there are two ways to do it, and both of them are in the category of direct contact heat exchangers. Th these are actually the heat exchangers that provide the best heat transfer rate. So one approach is to take, this, uh, okay, to take this mixture of gases and put it here, and then from the top spray cold liquid. So we have many small droplets going down while the hot gas is going up. And because of the high surface area of these small droplets, we get condensation of one of the components on the surface of these droplets. And the easiest way to do it is just to take the liquid from the bottom, cool it, and then send it back inside, or at least part of it. Because then we are not introducing a new material into the system, we are just using the liquid of the same material. Another approach is just the opposite. We take this, this hot gas mixture and bubble it, create small bubbles that go up through a bath of liquid, cold liquid. So this again creates a high uh, surface area for heat transfer and the condensation then happens on the boundaries of these little bubbles. And again, we are using the same liquid, the same component that needs to condense, so we are not introducing a new material into the system. 
So this is actually not a new idea, and there are systems like that in use in the industry, not at these temperatures and not for these materials, but at least the principle is working. So this is, for example, a system where we use water in order to condense steam from, from a mixture of steam with other gases. So this actually can work. Okay, so now we go back to the thermodynamic analysis, and what I'm presenting is just theory and concepts. Nothing was built yet, nothing was uh, operated yet, but checking the thermodynamics is the first thing that we need to do before we can propose to build something real, because if the thermodynamics doesn't work, then there's no point. If it does work and the result is good, maybe there's motivation to develop the process. So here is an analysis of uh, the process with the lithium, uh, lithium air uh, system, and so again, we have this uh, uh, system, we have some concentrator to concentrate radiation, solar radiation to the right amount, we have the reactor and the heat goes in here. Uh, we have two outputs of work, we have two inputs of energy, uh, thermal energy or radiation energy from the sunlight and carbon energy. So this is again a hybrid system. And here again, we did the two analyses, the ideal analysis to tell us what is the upper limit on conversion efficiency, and the more practical analysis where each component has a realistic efficiency and not the maximum possible efficiency. So here's the result. For the ideal cycle, first of all, if we have a hybrid system, we have to say how much of the energy comes from sunlight and how much from the a, a carbon source, so we see that 60 something percent come from solar energy. So this is mainly a solar cycle, but with a significant contribution from the carbon. And here is the distribution of the outputs. So most of the output comes from the electrochemical cell. There is a significant contribution from the work associated with the CO that we burn, we make steam, and we put into a power plant. Overall efficiency, overall efficiency is 77% and the solar efficiency is 68%. So this is the upper limit of efficiency and um, this is much higher compared to the zinc air system, for example. So lithium is really the best possibility, at least from those that we checked. And if we assign realistic efficiencies for the same cycle, we need to increase the solar energy input, so now it has more than 70% of the input. The output of the cell and the output of the CO are decreased because we have much higher losses. And the overall efficiency is now 37%, solar efficiency 35%. So also a little bit higher compared to the previous cycle that I've shown, the zinc air system. So if we summarize all of these numbers that I've shown, this is a scale of efficiency. Today we are here when we consider photovoltaics with battery or CSP with molten salt heat storage. CPV with battery, hypothetically, if we used it, it would be here. There was also a solar thermal system, which was a parabolic dish with Stirling engines. Also, it had very high efficiency. If we used that and if we had a good storage for it, it would be here. But the thermoelectrochemical system should have significantly higher efficiency. Well, more than double than what we have today. Uh, and one more exercise uh, to look at the sizes that we need for the solar plants and for the storage element. So if we, for example, normalize everything to one kilogram per second lithium flow, then we can take a solar field with a radius of slightly less than 300 meters. It will collect 70 megawatts of radiation falling onto the field and 50 megawatts at the top of the tower. And the amount of energy that it would, or the power that it would produce would be 37 megawatts, but not all of it solar, of course. Some of it is because of the carbon and about 25 megawatts is due to the solar energy. From the same land area, if we were to build a conventional photovoltaic plant, we would get 13 megawatts. If we put a parabolic trough system with CSP, we would get 11 megawatts. So from the same land area, which is also a resource that has to be conserved, we can generate much more energy. And finally, something interesting, if we had a molten salt system to store, let's say, 100 megawatt hour of electricity, then we would need two tanks about this uh, volume, 1200 cubic meter, and the temperature is 560 and 280 degrees. If we use the lithium air storage, we need three tanks, 
for the two separated components and for the oxide, but these are the relative sizes. We, the tanks are 27 cubic meters, 17 cubic meters, so really much smaller, and also the highest temperature is 200 degrees, so all the insulation and structural materials, everything will be simpler and cheaper. So it's always better to store chemically compared to storing uh, sensible heat. So I've told you about the nice things. Now for the problems <laughs> or the challenges. Uh, first of all, we need to take lithium oxide from the electrochemical cell after discharge and move it and heat it and mix it with carbon, but this is a solid. So moving solids and, and controlling them under high temperature is really a big problem. And uh, I think it can be done, but it is not easy. It is a technical challenge. Uh, the cycle involves moving lithium. And lithium is not a friendly material. It cannot come in contact with air or water vapor. So someone has to figure out all the safety and all the handling uh, in a system where lithium is not sitting in a sealed container, but it has to move from here to there to pump, to vaporize, to liquefy. So this is also not simple. Um, we would like to have the cell at 200 degrees in order to keep the lithium liquid, but the current membranes that are used in the electrochemical cells are not designed for 200 degrees, so maybe we need to find new membranes. This is not so simple. And the solar reactor at 1,000 degrees or so, there are people who operated solar reactors at 2,000 degrees, but it's difficult and it has a lot of problems, so even 1,000 degrees is not so simple, so this has to be designed um, properly. Uh, so to summarize, uh, this concept is for a system for unified conversion and storage of solar energy. So the same system converts from sunlight to electricity and along the way we also have a capability for storage. So it offers high efficiency, it offers flexible storage in the sense that storage is at low temperature and storage is stable almost indefinitely. Uh, and it is a flow battery that decouples capacity from power. Uh, the problems are high operating temperatures, which I think every one of us has to face if we are talking about ultra-high temperature, and many practical questions that need to be resolved. So what needs to be done, first of all, if the concept is good, we need to show that it actually works, and this we haven't done yet. This requires a uh, uh, really well-equipped lab and a lot of funding which we don't have yet. Uh, and if it works, then the plant engineering to take the concept from the lab to actual uh, engineering working plant is also a very big challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kribus, for your presentation. Questions? I'm Antonio Marti. If I understood well, in each cycle you also produce CO2. Yes. So aren't you afraid that this can be considered as a drawback because it's not a, let's yeah. say a clean process? Okay, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> it would be nice not to produce CO2 at all, but if the source of the carbon is a renewable source, then we have an argument to say that this is not really a greenhouse gas. It does not disturb uh, the, the natural cycle. It's carbon neutral. If, for example, we can produce carbon from biomass or from another renewable resource. If we take carbon from uh, natural gas or from coal, you are absolutely right. But in any case, uh, connecting with this point, I guess that, uh, that you can, can compare somehow the CO2 emissions of uh, your technology compared with another option that could be directly burning coal. Uh, and then probably, and since you have 70% of your input energy as solar, mm -hmm. probably the global CO2 emissions are, are much lower, right? Yes, that, that, that's correct. But uh, I think it was mentioned today that uh, most of the new electricity generation in the last uh, years is actually solar photovoltaic which has uh, almost no carbon emission. So it would be nice to be able to state that it's possible to do it with no carbon emission, not just to say that uh, we are winning the easy war against, uh, against coal. And another question is concerning, the, because you, you said that you want to use air in some of the cases, 
but air has nitrogen, and at those temperatures you could get uh, some oxides of nitrogen. Uh, have you considered this in your calculations? Okay, the cycle is called uh, lithium air or zinc air, but actually only the oxygen enters the electrochemical cell. So the nitrogen remains outside. Uh, wh and when you build a uh, cell like this, you have a, a membrane or electrode, porous electrode on the air side that allows the oxygen to come in, but it does not allow the nitrogen to come in. So we need to, to be careful, of course, not to allow air to enter the system in any other way. But the uh, uh, concept itself is to take the oxide from the electrochemical cell without the nitrogen and put only the oxide into the uh, recycling. Well, <coughs> if I understand, uh, if I have, un well, if I have understood uh, your presentation well at the beginning, uh, you, you have a number of equations, uh, chemical equations, that in the first, in the left side member, uh, they have the enthalpy. And uh, I guess in the right side mm. me uh, member of all these equations, you have the enthalpy of production of electricity that you, electricity that, y that you are not putting. Is that right? And I am right? Uh, and well, here it is let, let indicated, but uh, in many, Okay, here for example. Is uh, there an enthalpy uh, coming from the electricity you are producing in the second hand member? Uh, in, the, in the right. Uh, okay, you, you mean in this equation or yeah, in, in this the, one? Yeah, in this yeah. equation. Okay, in, you have in, in the first one, it's not a complete equation. We also have to say what happens to the electrons that, that appear in the equation. Okay, you're, you're right, it's not a complete equation. Okay, okay. Yeah. but of then in the, in the discharge, you have. You are producing electricity. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I, well, was, I, 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 I was focusing on the thermal side, so I neglected to make this accurate. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, uh, another point. I believe that uh, the ultimate uh, performance of thermophotovoltaics that you have put in 25% and is very okay, I agree. <coughs> Efficiency, I mean. Uh, I believe that if uh, you have, uh, it is possible to have, in my opinion, ultimately, in photovoltaics, 40% efficiency, and then the um, efficiency, the system efficiency could be in the range of what you mm -hmm. are mentioning, in yes. 36, 38. Of course, there are cells today that, that produce more than 40% efficiency, but these are multi-junction cells that are very expensive, and, and it's a different story. It's well, not in my standard. opinion, you yeah. need... True. You, you need, we need uh, to double junction cells for this 40% I have mentioned, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, uh, Professor Kribus.